When you think about archaeology, do you only think about dinosaurs and fossils from hundreds of millions of years ago? Or maybe the movie Jurassic Park? Well, that isn't the only place that archaeologists can find important things about our history. Today, we welcome historian and archaeologist Dr. Phil Levy to discuss his award-winning new book on George Washington. This is Too Complicated for History. Our guest today is Dr. Philip Levy, historian and archaeologist, professor at the University of South Florida, and he's also written a lot of books. Thanks for being here with us today, Phil. Great. Thanks thanks for having me. Happy to talk with you. So the book in particular that we would love to chat with you about first Mm -hmm. uh, is called Permanent Resident. Permanent Resident. Sorry, I mumbled through that. Uh, (laughs) And it's actually about... George Washington, but comes at it from a particularly interesting angle. Um, could you explain the premise of the of, of your book to, to our audience? Yeah, it's um, the quote actually comes from Washington himself, where he writes late in life that it wasn't until about 1774 that he thought of himself as the permanent resident of Mount Vernon, um, which is interesting because he's already made all sorts of changes by that time. There's a whole lot of stuff to get into. But uh, <laughs> That also happens to overlap with the time that he sells Ferry Farm, which was his childhood home. So I'm very interested in those kinds of connections. Um, so th- what the book is, uh, essentially, is a what I came to think of as a sort of archaeological biography of Washington. Um, so hmm. looking at Washington's life and the places of his life and the meaning of those places through the lens of archaeology. So instead of organizing it around politics or the military or what have you, it's organized by archaeology sites. Um, Where have we had extensive excavations? What do those excavations have to say? And uh, how do they fit together? And this idea came to me a while ago. Initially, I thought it would be an essay volume, but I decided to just kind of go with myself. Um, Mm -hmm. And to sort of string together the spine of the biography and look at the different sites that way. It's very much about Washington, but like all the things I've written, it's also probably 60, 40 more about the places and the meaning of the places and memory and uses, which is really sort of where my core interest resides. Washington's an interesting figure, no doubt, but um, I am always more drawn to sort of how his, what people call his life and legacy, you know, his meaning uh, Mm -hmm. continues in other settings, how he comes to be used as an historical symbol in a variety of, of other times. So a lot of what I write is as much about the 20th century, the 19th century, as it is about uh, the 18th century. So I'm trying to keep those things dynamically going back and forth. But archaeology is like that. Um, when, you, when you dig a site, yeah. you have to dig through you know, more contemporary layers to get to later layers, and those are your responsibilities also. So that sort of interplay of time uh, is, is sort of where I'm coming from. And in this case, Washington is the, the organizer. These are all sites that... that are places of Washington's life in important ways. So before we get too deep into that, I was wondering if you could give us just a quick overview of your relationship with George Washington, sort of historically and archaeologically, because you've done a lot of really cool things. Thanks. So can you just give us sort of a catch up of all the cool things you've done? Yeah, regarding, um, you know, Washington. Thanks for saying they're cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a Washington nerd. So. Right, right. <laughs> I guess let's, let's do this as a narrative. Let's tell it as a story. It's probably the easiest way to do this. Um, I never thought I'd be doing this. I never really anticipated that Washington was going to play such a big role in my career. <laughs> but uh, when I uh, began teaching, when I finished graduate school, David Morocco, who's been a longtime uh, collaborator, archaeology partner of mine, uh, started working at Ferry Farm, which is George Washington's childhood site, uh, boyhood home site in Fredericksburg, Virginia. And I started teaching. He started this new project. And so we had been working together for almost a decade anyway, so we figured let's let's shift things to there. And um, so I started bringing students up to Ferry Farm in the summers to do excavations. And although I didn't anticipate it, that project ended up becoming sort of the centerpiece of my work. And partly because the place is so redolent with stories, the cherry tree being the most famous of all of them, uh, that pulled me into spaces of memory, what historians call memory. And um, and 
other questions of landscape, which I had been interested in already. And, and so Washington sort of filtered in that way. In fact, um, when Dave and I started excavating there, I think that we thought that we would um, just kind of focus on the 1740s, which is we knew sort of the core period of the occupation for the Washington family. Um, and then our previous interest in the 17th century would would pretty much stay in place. And we would just sort of shift a little later, ask some, some of the questions about landscape and enslavement and so on that we were asking in the 17th century, we'd sort of bring to the 1740s. Um, but as Dave says about the site, and it's true, it's like it, it changes everybody. You, know, you, you end up with completely different sets of interests than you ended up with. And I became mm. kind of obsessed with, um, with how that landscape changed over time. It benefits from having a series of photographs uh, I wouldn't mm -hmm. say it's a benefit that there was a civil war battle there or a few civil war battles there. It's not <laughs> something you really want to have on your property. But um, the result is that there's a lot of attention to that landscape, partly because of Washington, partly because Stafford Heights, where it sits opposite Fredericksburg on the other side of the Rappahannock, mm -hmm. affords this beautiful view of the city of Fredericksburg. And artists and photographers have gone there again and again and again, particularly during the war and after, to capture that view. So we have a series of photographs from the 1860s that show how a 19th century plantation, not the Washington plantation, but a 19th century one, though it's possible there's some Washington buildings still there, um, mm -hmm. probably unlikely. But uh, it, it shows how that goes from being a sort of regular 19th century farmstead to being a place with no buildings but trees and then a place with no buildings and no trees. So you can see over the course <laughs> of the war how the place just gets mowed down. Um, and so we get photographs of our site in, in like the middle of the 19th century. It's kind of amazing. Wow. You don't usually get that. That's cool. And then there's art <laughs> associated with it as well, paintings. Right. And, you know, so I, I just found myself just intrigued by that. And I just couldn't stop thinking about it and playing with it and looking at those photographs and sequencing them and trying to, you know, do those wonderful photographic triangulation games, you know, like see the corner of a building here. Well, what is that over there? What has come into existence? Um, by mm -hmm. the, uh, the 1920s, the early part of the 20th century, as Americans are getting ready for the Washington birth bicentennial in 1932, there are a series of promoters that start to try to turn the landscape into something. And we get more photography and you get, you get to see how the buildings have changed again and how the world has shifted. And sort of an enterprising farmer gets involved in this project. And so that sort of pulled me away from doing sort of more straightforward 17th century work that I had initially been right. interested in. Uh, and that became uh, a book called Where the Cherry Tree Grew that uh, came mm -hmm. out in 2013. That's the story of Fairy Farm. And that is sort of a, a, a wide sweep landscape story about how this place changed and took meaning over time. And there's some great stories in there, just some really fascinating, fun things. Uh, Paul Nasca, who had been one of the, uh, uh, who was the crew chief directing the archaeology, had found a bunch of these records of um, Civil War soldiers who were writing letters home about being encamped on the Washington site. There's great stuff around that. Um, mm -hmm. Then I, I, there's this wonderful court case uh, that goes from 1930, I think, all the way through about 1940, where a foundation that's trying to preserve the Washington home, it doesn't exist, but you know they're trying anyway. Um, and they get into it, the project goes belly up in 1929. I guess is when everything starts to fall apart because of the economy and the deal that they have with the farmer JB Colbert, who was the owner. He built this beautiful deal with them, or is really like you know really got the better of these backers, was making a ton of money off of this. <laughs> and um, the deal falls apart because the money fails, and you get this extensive lawsuit in the Stafford County records of them oh, fighting gosh. it out, and all this just fascinating stuff. And, you know, it, hmm. it just kept on giving. They just kept on being more and more. There's a, an attempt that is, well, there's an attempt that they do. They establish a boys' home there uh, in 1960, or, or the early 60s, I should say. It lasts for about a decade. Um, they built some buildings. Some of those buildings are still there. But they have records about, you know, how, how they want, you know, the, the fantasy of the Washington landscape they want to build, all imbued with this sort of religious symbolism and you know and, and cherry tree mm -hmm. mythology and and what happens in this of course is this notion of the cherry tree the shadow of the cherry tree if you want to call it that sort of sits over all of this stuff so i right. got really interested in 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 that story and how that story mm -hmm. functions um and I, I remember when we did uh our um sort of announcement of findings in 2008 when we were ready to say that we had located the washington child at home uh, we had all this press. It was a National Geographic project. We had um, you know, lots of great help from them, mostly in the form of publicity. They were fabulous in getting the word out. And so we had you know, hundreds of newspaper stories and were interviewed on radio and you know, it did, did all sorts of things. Uh, and one of the things I would say 
is that this is the site of the cherry tree story. Um, this is where mm -hmm. that story took place. And uh, mm -hmm. for generations of Americans, for many Americans, that story was true. Um, I, right. I don't think we think it's true necessarily, but the, th the thing yeah. that I would say about it is as, as fake stories go, it's actually fairly believable. You know, it, it doesn't, right. it doesn't have a, a giant blue ox, you, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, it's a kid who chops at a tree. It's not, it, it's not implausible. Right. Um, right. and the more time I spent with the story, not that, not that I'm trying to argue that the story is true. Right. But, um, it's just not, you know, a, a complete fantasy, right. It's, it's within the realm of possibility. And there are other stories associated with it, which right. have been lost, right. That the story got extracted mm -hmm. from Weems's writing, Parson Weems, who created the story. First, I think in 1807, right. I think 1807 or 1809 is when it first appears. Um, and he'd written several editions of his Life of Washington before. Uh, so he's, you know, finding or making these things up. And I think the historical question would be, did he make it up or did he find it? Was he told that story? Doesn't make it true, right? right. Did, but did he, did he hear it from someone as he claimed or did he make it up out of whole cloth? And I don't think we have an answer for that. But what got lost, and I've sort of written this in other things, in that the story gets extracted, the truth part of the story, the I cannot tell a lie, was extracted mm -hmm. uh, by a guy named McGuffey who produced these, uh, these readers to, to teach uh, American school children how to read. And that story becomes a standalone. It takes it out mm -hmm. of its larger context, which was actually an environmental parable uh, based on Leviticus and based on mm -hmm. um, that if you don't take care of the earth, the earth will punish you. And it's, just, it's very simple. It's about stewardship. And, huh. um, yeah. and George's cutting of the tree in, the, in Weems's original version is only one part mm -hmm. of Augustine sort of realizing he has to teach this child to respect the land and be a good steward of the land. So Weems is writing this right. biblical story, biblical environmental parable for a farmer audience. You know, it, it's really mm -hmm. more about sure. taking care of the land, which has all sorts of interesting right. environmental resonances now. And I've even written in some places about how we can sort of rethink how that story serves us as we confront things like climate change. How can we sort of turn our American mythology into, into other stories but, and use, our, use the figures in different ways? But, um, you know, it, it takes on this whole life of its own. But at root, it's just a very, very straightforward story. But it, it affects everything in very far. But so as I was saying, when, when I would talk about this, I got hostile email from people like how, you know, it, that I'm insinuating that the, the cherry tree story was true. How could you insinuate the cherry right. tree story was true? And the um, level of emotion um, was fascinating. Right? His story still right. elicits emotion. Huh. I saw people in the 20s, and I wrote about this in another book, a 2015 book called George Washington Written Upon the Land, which comes from mm -hmm. another piece of that story. Uh, just as right. a sidebar, uh, in that story, Augustine Washington takes uh, cabbage seeds and he plants, he, he scratches George Washington's name into the ground and puts the seeds in so that the seeds will grow up and spell his name on the land. Right. And when George <laughs> comes running over, like, oh my gosh, you know, look at this miracle. You have to come see this thing. And he goes, his father takes him out or they go out and Augustine says to him, you know, look at it. And, and, and George kind of figures out, wait a minute, this, this can't happen. Max, did you do this? And, and Augustine says, yes, I did. Of course, it's such an action has to have an author, has to have the, the father do it just as nature has to have an author. And that author is God, right? So right. He's, you know, he's, he's using right. these stories in this very, you know, he's a, you know, preacher, he's a pastor, right? This is what he does. Yeah, exactly. So, um, I talked about that in, in that book, but one of the things, uh, that you see in the 20s is how fiercely people hold on to this. And what started to happen and made Fairy Farm distinctive and still interesting to me, I mean, I'm, I'm you know, not writing about it right now. I have an essay that will come out soon, but uh, um, about the tree itself. But uh, what makes it sort of consistently and persistently interesting is that what started to happen in the bicentennial period, 1932, the lead up to it, the decade before, is that as Weems was more and more marginalized in the writing of history, it really begins at the turn of the century. Um, mm -hmm. Historians, they're, they're, they're critics from the very beginning, right? They're people who dislike that book from the start. Right. But as sure. the profession of history professionalizes and becomes more of a, more of a, a self-proclaimed serious venture, um, there's a real desire on the part of historians at the turn of the century to move away from fabulists like Weems, um, Benson Lossing is another one who they sort of mm -hmm. go after. So they really want to distance themselves. Weems bothers them, I think, because Weems makes a citation claim and he's like, play in the historian's game. Like, see, it's oh, not me. I right. got this from someone. So it's like, you can't cite right. stuff. That's what we do. So um, 
you know, it's like something bothersome. And you start getting people, Henry Cabot Lodge is one of the early ones, but you get others who start to write and say, we will never know the real George Washington until we sort of banish the fabulous like Weems. And they all come back oh, to Weems in the cherry tree. So for a while, and read a lot of these Washington biographies, but um, mm-hmm. for a while in the writing of them, there's this little perfunctory moment in the beginning where you swing by, you take a shot at Weems, you know, you say, you know, how terrible he is, and then you can get down to your serious project, <laughs> which is to know the real George, which of course was Parson right. Weems's project. Like that's what he said he wanted to do. So, yeah. you know, they, they sort of adopt his project, but have to throw him overboard. And, and as that <laughs> happens, the, the serious scholars, if that's what we want to say, right, serious writers, as Chew Weems, and only sort of folklorist people sort of at a, at a more popular level might attach to it. But for Fairy Farm, that landscape becomes the cherry tree landscape. Right. And as a result, it's associated so heavily with these made-up stories and, and right. derided stories in this period that it's essentially mm-hmm. overlooked during the Washington Bicentennial. Uh, people who are working at the ah. promotion of the birthplace um, down in Westmoreland County, which are doing a lot of work with now, great site. Um, mm-hmm. uh, the, the promoters, the private promoters, not the, not the government, not the park service, but the private promoters called the Wakefield National Memorial Association. They, a few of them, are working very hard to marginalize Ferry Farm. They're writing pieces of newspapers. They're sort of writing to writing to backers, saying, "Ignore this. This is wrong. He didn't live there anyway." They're really, and, and it's the cherry tree. It, it's there's a real real stigma associated with this and. Uh, you have from that period on people loving the cherry tree. So what they do is they build cherry trees. They put cherry trees there all the time. So every year there are people who donate cherry trees and the place gets covered in cherry trees. <laughs> there's even a plan to line the road from Fredericksburg up to Ferry Farm with like a thousand cherry trees, you know, oh 500 gosh. on one side, 500 on the other. <laughs> it's all cherry trees. But it it slips the leash of serious stuff and becomes completely... Right. The, the 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 purview of sort of these these you know self made you know self you know uh, I'm not sure what the right word is right I don't want I don't want to deride them um, mm-hmm. they're just not the historical establishment they're very serious people they're they're very right. passionate about what they what they care about it's just that the historical establishment just thinks that they're what they're talking about is nonsense and um, right. you know th- that leads to a whole marginalization of a landscape. Which is a fascinating thing because there is, as we know, an 18th century site there. Like Washington lived there. There's real stuff going exactly. on, and it the end right. result was that the place was, I would say, ignored, but was marginal really until the 1990s. It was, you know, it it did not get the attention that other places did, and uh, as a result, we were able to go in and start excavating it in 2001. There'd been excavations before, but they were they were small. Um, when when Dave came in, that was when. Uh, the George Washington Foundation started the, the full real enterprise to take this thing apart and make sense of it for real. And that's what we have now. And now there's a reconstructed building on the site. Um, there's a whole lot of things going on there and, and excavations continue. But so much of this rests on the fact that it was marginalized because of its association with the cherry tree. And as that story became maligned, the site became maligned. And that passion's still there. People were very upset that I was talking about the cherry tree. It's the weirdest thing. So sorry for the interruption, but we're going to take a brief break now for a word from our sponsors. That doesn't surprise me at all that people are upset. I'm, I'm, I'm mostly, not that I've ever heard anyone, you know, upset about it before or, or mention your, your work on it. But Lynn, we've talked to a lot of historians about George Washington. I, I don't mm-hmm. think anyone, you're the first person that has expressed any tangential interest in sort of like what the context of weems outside yeah. of like sort of poo-pooing it still like exactly like what you were we were talking about it like you know oh there's that other you know those are the stories that people know mm-hmm. or whatever um so it doesn't surprise me that there was a, a visceral reaction and i find that that's so fascinating that the site was marginalized and they wanted to get at the real washington and then rejected this and you know, I, I don't know if you know, sort of like Lynn and I's partnership and sort of exploration of Washington was rooted in the fact that we don't think he's very well understood mm-hmm. today. Mm-hmm. Like that idea of trying to get at the real Washington is 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 uh, uh, still a project that people are undertaking currently. Um, right. N- n- done i i mean maybe it was it's better now that they've gotten rid of some of the fabulists. Yeah, fabulists. Uh, it's a great uh, term. notions of it. Yeah, <laughs> it, it is, it's a very great term. I like that a lot. Um, but I don't. But I'm not actually. I'm not 100 percent sure if, it, if that's 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 how things are not. Well, but, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I sort of like to hang out at this edge, and you know, I'm, I'm sort of most interested yeah. in uh, 
things that are that are half real. Right? Um, <laughs> it's, it's sort of more interesting to me in some ways. And the question is like, why does Washington continue to resonate for Americans? Um, mm-hmm. right. And and there's another question inside of that, which is why is there a constituency within what we could call sort of the world of Washington um, uh, that is constantly lamenting that Washington isn't resonating enough, right? So, so he's right, always sure. resonating and there's always a group of people who are saying he's not resonating enough or maybe not resonating right. properly. Um, that's a really interesting arena. And, and so I've been trying to poke at that for a long time and I'm not done. I have other stuff I'm working on. I'm working on a different project we can talk about later right now that, that I need to finish up that grows out of the birthplace work. But, um, but I'm going to be returning to some of the core questions I've been asking for a while and work on, been collecting stuff, but I'm going to be doing a book soon on Washington frauds, uh, which I've collected a little bit about oh, and wrote nice. a little bit about in the permanent resident. I have one guy in particular and that work sent me off on a really interesting, strange goose chase, which you can talk about perhaps, but um, huh. so, you know, it, it doesn't have to be real for it to mean something. I mean, this is sort of the fundamental premise right. of the way historians right. talk about memory. Um, you know, right. memory as opposed to sort of history and historiography. So if we think of, and there are a lot of different valences, there's a lot of different scholarship and theory around how to understand memory, but at the most simple level, which is actually where, where I find it's actually most useful. Um, there are distinctions within memory, but they're often, sometimes they feel like distinctions without difference. Um, so we right. can sidestep that a little bit and, and just focus on at core what's going on here, particularly viewed from perspective of the material world that i deal with mostly if history is an ongoing discussion between sources and historians um based on refining and and looking again but it's an ongoing discussion mm-hmm. that shifts right. over time because the historians are always shifting and they're prioritizing different things and bringing in new sources and new ideas and the dialogue is often sort of moving so history is an ever-changing arena as the discussion right. shifts Absolutely. as the people shift memory is a different engagement with the past. It's, it's co-equal engagement with the past, but it's an engagement with the past that's rooted in wanting things to not change. So it's very right. much about sort hmm. of receiving things and holding on to them and preserving them and holding them. So and, and they blur because the whole world of preservation sits half within memory in some ways and half within right. within history. But uh, sure. if you think of like what you learn as a child, what your grandmother told you, the ideas that, that come with the word heritage, uh, this mm-hmm. is sort of the space of memory. And scholars, I think, understand this as a, as a co-equal sphere. So we have a very large and productive scholarship on how memory functions. Co-equal memory in, 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 what, in what sense? In, in importance? Well, in, in the or sense that, in, let's put it this way. The past is the thing we're looking at. Uh-huh. The past doesn't exist. Right, it's it's gone. <laughs> you can't reach out and touch it. It's right. not yeah. there. We have to recreate it. I mean, yeah. I, I tell and students, interpret. yeah, exactly. It's I, I tell students, yeah. that, you know, if we if we were studying frogs, we could get some frogs and we could look at them. You know, they've got some material <laughs> right. reality, you know. But, <laughs> but the past isn't there. All we all we have are remnants from it. And so, what do we do with sure. those remnants? How do we interact with them? And so. As historians, we know our system of interaction. It's a privileged one, and it's a good one. It, it deserves a sort of pride of place in many ways. Um, it's it's a it's a good substantive interaction with the past through sources and you know in, in their broadest possible definition, um, and engagement with other people working with similar things and perspectives and theory and ideas and philosophy and so on. Whereas memory mm-hmm. is just another way to get at the past. It's it, but it's yeah. I would say co-equal because more people have their understandings of the past shaped by the forces of memory right. than they do by historiography. Hmm. And the actions that they take in real time in the current world are shaped by memory forces often more so than by, than by history. Hmm. If, you, if you follow what's happening in Ukraine, for example, if, you, if you're paying attention hmm. to the kind of historical fantasy that, that Vladimir Putin has been selling, this is, this is a memory fantasy. This is, this is not, substantive sure. history but it is it is mm-hmm. driving a major international conflict right so right. and and you can wave as much historiography as you want and say yeah but this is a really bad read of the relationship between kiev and and you know and the roost right it's like <laughs> nobody can't it's not gonna you're not gonna the, the tanks are not right. gonna stop because you have a well-sided monograph right, right? so <laughs> right. It, it, it just doesn't work right. that way so you know we see this again and again and again i mean the fight that we've been having nationally over things like confederate memorialization um, mm-hmm. is, is rooted in this, in this exact issue. You know, you have the historians saying, but so many of the statues, particularly the ones that have been removed, um, 
most of the ones have been removed are, are associated with another period or, or, or toward another project. Um, where I live in Tampa, the, the Confederate memorial that was down by the courthouse was erected in 1911. Um, you know, it, it's it's right. a segregation project. There's you know, right. so as an historian, you can say, right, that's what this is. But for other people, it's it's not that they're 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 imbuing it with a set of meanings. Del Upton has written about this a little bit. Uh, says you kind of have to take seriously when people say that you know you're getting rid of the past because for a lot of people that actually is their physical marker for the past. They're not reading monographs. They're not engaged with the scholarship, but that is their reminder. And when it goes away, you know, if if they see that and that's their interaction with that piece of the American past and suddenly it's not there anymore, then they are losing that interaction. And then we can say quite rightly, but there's scholarship, there's mountains of stuff you could look at, but they're not doing that. So right. there's, you know, the, they're, they pull differently, but, uh, but memory, this kind of memory, the way I'm talking about it, I, I don't think we can ignore. Um, it's a really, really powerful thing. And of course they, they, they blend together, right? It's, you know, because right. it's a memory impulse that might get you to be an historian of a particular thing. It might lead you into sort of a professional endeavor and the history that gets written filters back into the memory space also. So even though they're in some way separate, they're also still in dialogue with each other. So, yeah, I, and I think that that it's memory is um, essential in a way. Like you can't re- like eject yourself. Like you can't remove it from from from. This is the the uh, you bring up Russia actually reminded me mm-hmm. of, of 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 the need for the rulers of like Kiev and Rus, like those early empires, to build a memory, like a right, story right. about where they came from and who they were. That was set, like completely, or at least likely fabricated or or ex- exaggerated um but even you know we we're in charge now and we need to build a sort of history behind this to give us weight moving forward and it inspires um, action it's so necessary it, it yeah inspires exactly. action so you can't you can you know stamp your little feedies as much as you want that it's not historically sound if it's inspiring action then it's still a force in our world and and we have to deal with hmm. it and there are a lot of scholars working on this i mean i'm not unique at all in this respect there, there are a lot of people sort yeah. of looking at this for me this is to bring it back to washington this is kind of the part of washington i find most fascinating this is the stuff i'm sort of most drawn to so sorry for the interruption but we're going to take a brief break now for a word from our sponsors Right. And and along the lines of this sort of memory um, versus history, um, I always love your books because they always Thanks. make me look at things differently. I mean, I'm not an archaeologist, but you do make me want to be one. Um, and <laughs> Sorry just, about it's that. one of those things that when <laughs> when when I read your books, you know, and I think this is the greatest compliment. It's like when somebody invents something and you say, why has no one done this before? As far as George Washington and place, I've never read anything like this before. And one of the things that you made me think about was as far as archaeology, when you were talking about the Washington birthplace and you said that they kept finding different original foundations and that, you know, this was the original. No, 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 it's not. Then this is the original that I started to wonder, does it to what extent does it even matter which one is the original? Because it was all about um, the way the public was sort of interacting with it. And in fact, they even built a house that is so obviously 19th century that for a while they said was um, Pope's Greek, you know, his house. And so it just made me wonder, you know, like we're talking about memory, does it really matter that much that they didn't find the original or, um, you know, what is the, what is the overarching, you know, sort of goal of, of all of this finding different foundations and then building different houses. They put a monument over one. Does it really matter? And to whom, I should say. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, that's the other piece. Because like, it matters whom. to me. Yeah, right. <laughs> because, you know, because I'm like, I want to know which one is the real one. Um, but it seems like throughout it wasn't that important when it came to interpreting. Yeah, I mean, and we're, as you, I think you know, we're in the middle of sort of working this over again. We've re-excavated that building that was right. excavated in 1930 and 1936. Uh, New South Associates did a beautiful job last summer opening it up, and we're still figuring out a lot of what it means and making sense of that site, even though that site has never been fully excavated. There are, there are features out there that have never been located because everybody who put a shovel in the ground was sure that the first thing they hit was George Washington's birthplace. So, so you know, I got it. Right. Oh, I got it over there. No, I got it over here. So, it, you know, it, it's the only reason they're digging. Maybe it's just that it's so much effort in the heat that they're just like, ah, this darn well better be it because it's... <laughs> It was exhausting. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, so to whom does it matter, right? And that's so we could make a distinction between 
the situation that we have now, which is the land is owned and operated by the National Park Service, which mm-hmm. is an arm of the federal government. They want to be right, right? I mean, they, they, they need a good answer, right? That's, that's for a lot of different reasons, right? A lot of different stuff comes mm-hmm. to bear on that. So they have an understandable interest in getting this right. Um, I've said for a long time that we're approaching with ever increasing speed the tricentennial of Washington's birth. And for a moment, everybody's going to look to yeah. that site and that site has to have its ducks in a row. It, it has to be able to say this is it right. and not have the kind of story it had a decade ago, which was more mm-hmm. confused and not certain. And the excavations of the 1930s were were good for what they were, but they right. they were far less definitive than than their language suggested. Um, we're starting to get a better focus on this because it's all been re-excavated and we're starting to look at it for real now. And we're answering questions that there was nobody there to answer in the 1930s. So the record they created in the 1930s, we can only look at, it's like looking, you know, we're going from something being not in focus, kind of blurry to, to really focusing on it and being able to answer some real questions. So we're getting close to, right. to doing that. Um, so for the Park Service, yes, they, they're going to get this right, for sure. Um, for the Wakefield National Memorial Association, the people who sort of mm-hmm. built that house you referred to, which is now called the Memorial House, mm-hmm. they are, again, this is this difference between memory and history. They're sort of operating in a different sphere. They're right. interested in what is fit and what's appropriate and what makes sense and what resonates for them. And they have a guy involved in that project um, who is just adamant that Washington would not have been born in a in a, a rustic home, just it, that cannot have happened. It just can't. So, and some of that huh. goes back to him engaging with with the writing and the art of fabulists in the middle of the nineteenth century, who did mm-hmm. portray Washington. But Weems himself says that Ferry Farm, the home that we excavated, uh, he writes in in the early nineteenth century about people going and looking at its front of faded red. Is I think how he phrases it. And that it's kind of tumbled down. And we know this archaeologically. The building was in terrible condition. It was gone by 1833. Um, mm-hmm. It was built before 1728. And it was a good gentry home when it was built. And when Augustine Washington purchased it around 1738 and moved his family there, it was a good and appropriate gentry home. Um, it loses that. By 1760, it looks a little small. It looks, it looks a little inadequate. The homes have changed. Right. And it just it goes, you know... Mary Washington moved by 1774 over over mm-hmm. on the other side to Fredericksburg. The home gets leased, mm-hmm. it gets sold. Then it's leased out to tenants. They, they change its orientation. They dig a new cellar. It, it gets sort of more and more run down to the point where by when Weems is describing it, yeah, it's, it's a run down home. But people look at that and they see a run down home that doesn't look anything as majestic as other colonial buildings in the area and say, oh, he had, he had a rustic childhood. And, and right. the Weems perpetuates that and, and you see this again and again. So these people now, you know, a century later, a uh, century and a half almost later, were pushing against the idea of this rustic childhood. They didn't want that, but they go too far mm-hmm. the other way. They kind of overcompensate and imagine grandeur. Where, where none existed. And what happens with the building of that memorial home, that, that birthplace home, is they build, it's actually not that bad an 18th century building. I think most Virginians would be pretty happy to have that. It, um, it's large. It's, it's, a lot, it's a like Gunston Hall. It's, it's kind of a Gunston <laughs> Hall variant. Um, looks a lot like a place called Twifford, which was the grandmotherly home of the woman who's sort of the main backer of the project. So she's sort of, you know, insin- insinuating sort of Instantiating her family story into the Washington story, but they want to build a fitting mm-hmm. tribute, and they talk about it that way. It's you know that it has mm-hmm. to be appropriate. Well, what does appropriate mean? You know, we just wouldn't use that language anymore. We wouldn't talk right. about it that way, or at least on the scholarly side, we wouldn't. You could imagine right. a memory discussion. It would have to be fitting, whatever that means. Fitting means how we want it to be, right. to, you know, how we right. place this person. Fitting for us. The, the person we're talking about is never going to see it, at least as far as we understand <laughs> cosmology, right? You know, but um, you know, it, it's for us. What are we? How are? What are we telling the people around us about how much we venerate the figure we're all talking about? That's really what's going right. on. And so you end up with this interesting construction, which, as I wrote about, uh, many people have written about. It's hardly unique here, right? The other people, Jordan Bezos, written about. You know, this, this has been around for a while, but um, uh, that uh they blow out some 18th century foundations when they, when they built this thing. There's, there's a set of foundations that are very odd. It would be great to see them because they're really unusual. Um, they are probably not a domestic structure, uh, just from what we see of the one drawing of them. 
but uh, they blew them out when they when they put the cellar in for the memorial home, so it's gone, whatever it was. But it, the fact that there were 18th century bricks there um, was enough. It was like, yeah, that's it, we got it. And so for them, placement is almost metaphorical. It's what it's it's what, what right. should be, what should happen, right. even if it wasn't. What we're seeing now is that it's a much more complicated story, and that the mm-hmm. boyhood home, or the, sorry, the birthplace story is extremely complicated and and full of uncertainties that probably won't have answers that we'll ever see because the nature of the records it's just it's just very unclear and the answers are still out there um you know there's a lot of stuff unexcavated and there are things out there that are very promising but you know i don't know when they would ever be excavated so but yeah there's it's so the the right question is like who and why like why do they want this claim so right. um you know, there's also to go back to the, the issue at stake at the birthplace. In the 1930s, 20s, 30s, when this is happening, you know, it's we have access to so much Washington material now, and Lynn's kind of a player in why we have some of this access, right? It, there, there's right. so much access. So you want to know a question about George? You know, you just can go online and look it up. I mean, you, you and you, and you could find the transcription. Of you know, if you can't go online, yeah, you go to the, the library. Document. You can find the transcript. Yeah. You can find a photo of the actual document. You know, if you're lucky, right. you can go to the library. Somebody will trot it out for you. You know, you have access at an unprecedented level. When you look at how the biographies work, when you go farther back, people don't have access to the documents. It's rare that someone right. does, and so you'll get some writers who, uh, like Jared Sparks, who has access to documents, destroyed documents too, but he had access to documents. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> anything he writes is a transcription that becomes gold, right? That's like the next biographer who doesn't have access to documents is going to use his transcription, even though it's fragmentary, right? right? And so each biography, they end up being built on the last biography. Mm -hmm. And so you get the repetition of these stories over and over and over again. And there's the possibility of, of being wrong is enormous. And so you end up in the early 20th century with these people who are document collectors. They find a document and, Mm -hmm. um, they bought it or they acquired it in one way and they don't have access to all the documents that we have. They're not all put in a repository, but they've got their document and there are a bunch of people running around contesting where Washington was born. No, he was born here. No, he was born over there. And there's like big, mm-hmm. big sort of low level fight around this with a bunch of different odd people. This will come up in the stuff I'm writing about the forgers because this, the, one of the, one of the forgers is involved in this, but um, it has some really weird contentions and he misreads a document that's at the library of Congress. Now you can read it and see that he misread a, a, a date um, and, you know, it happens, but, uh, so the people in, in the, the Wakefield association, they are very concerned to prove that they got the place right. They're, they're up against people who are saying, no, you're in the wrong part of the landscape. You're in the wrong County, right? You know, they're just, you know, I can't say County, but you know what I mean? They're, they're arguing that this is the wrong place. So all of their work is about saying, no, this is the spot. And they're just sort of right. satisfied right. with that. Um, so they did do that work effectively, but that's the battle that they're having. We're not having that battle anymore. There really isn't any right. dispute. Um, and that the Washington birth home is right in that area. It's either in that set of features that was excavated in 36, which is a very good mm-hmm. possibility, um, or it's really close by. But that's it. We're not, we're not, nobody's arguing that he was born on the other side of Bridges Creek or, you know, none of those right. arguments exist anymore. Um, so now you can zero in, but you know, what is it that you want to get out of it? How do, how does the person, how does the speaker position themselves within the discussion? Um, and that's when you start to get it. Like, why are they so concerned to do what they see as fitting? It's because of what they're saying about themselves. Hmm. Everyone has an agenda. Yeah, (laughs) we all do. We all do. Right. Yeah. Uh, you may have actually just answered this question, um, but, um, uh, (laughs) I, this is, you know, coming from a non-academic uh, background, archaeology in general, like, has a much more, um, I guess, sandy notion in my head, <laughs> like, to, to put it metaphorically, like, it, it I don't associate archaeology with exploration of, like, America's history. Oh, okay. like, that's not my, my, my first thought. It seems that's like that, that's a, that's an area. <laughs> yes, Andy. Yeah, like um, uh, mostly probably um, uh, uh, influenced very heavily by like Rachel Weiss's character from The Mummy, uh, growing up <laughs> or whatever. Um, but uh, yeah, I, how important do you see it as uh, uh, see archaeology and sort of the you know the understanding of like the academic pursuit of understanding you know American history because I, I even just all the stuff that you're discussing it's just slightly outside of my wheelhouse and, and even just the little bit of history that i'm aware of um but it seems like there's a really robust uh and a lot to learn 
<laughs> yeah, well, let's give a plug uh, for American historical archaeology, right? That you know, yeah. this is a thriving yeah. field. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think you're right that there is, you know, it, it's only a century. It's maybe older than a century. There are excavations in the 19th century that qualify as historical archaeology. But um, you see the field really starting to define itself in maybe the middle of the 20th century. And now to the point where it's, it's, sure. it's understood as, you know, it, its own thing. Yeah, there, there was a long understanding that archaeology would be the study of those places and things that have no records and then places mm-hmm. that had gotcha. records. Well, we, you know, we, we got records for that. We don't need this. And that, that doesn't really exist anymore. So, so historical archaeology sure. is, is can be defined as being the study, the, the archaeological study of places, sites, characters, settings, so on, where there is also documentation. Now that, that becomes fuzzy too, because what do you do with Mayan sites where there are sort of, kind of forms of documents on pyramids and so on and so on. But um, right. But basically, when we talk about American historical archaeology, we're talking about uh, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th century, 20, even 20th century. So what it brings to the discussion that's different, and obviously, you know, I, I, I continue to play in that arena. I find that arena really productive and fascinating, and, and I think has shaped how I understand the doing of all this anyway, um, to the point where, you know, that's just how I approach things. One way to look at it would be that the material record constitutes another kind of text about the past. It doesn't mm-hmm. have to be a better one, but it's a different one. And it allows you to see things that you don't see otherwise. There, there's, I've, you can read people who reflect on, you know, that unconscious action happens in the deposit of material. So you're seeing sort of unconscious behavior. And this, this ties into the fact that most historical archaeologists come from anthropology and are sort of looking at larger patterns of human behavior, right? So, hmm. And that's a long legacy. It's not always the case, but, um, but that's often how it's worked. But what's happened over the decades as the field has become ever more sophisticated and developed in dialogue with archaeology, ever more sophisticated ways of understanding the functioning of space and objects within space, it started to bounce back so that now you can bring archaeological thought method and inquiry to landscapes without even necessarily having to excavate them. It's because there's now there's a set of questions and premises that you can bring to bear and, and start to ask some different things. So, and we're in a time uh, and have been for maybe 20 more years where disciplinary boundaries are all collapsing anyway. And, and you can find historians who are doing fabulous anthropology and anthropologists who are doing fabulous history and historical archaeologists are doing good, you know, doing great history. And it's, you know, it's where you start sometimes doesn't determine where you, where you end up. Right. So I hope that gets to it, but no, I think it's, um, archaeology is much more than just, you know, a a pre-contact or ancient past that it certainly is there, no question and doing valuable work, but that doesn't mean that a 20th century can dump in Colorado can't be treated as a really valuable archaeology site and have really interesting insights, not just about, um, you know, site-specific stuff, but about something much larger, about much larger patterns. So, you know, the other thing to keep in mind is that we, as a civilization, made this transition into consumerism um, and you know, a deeply material set of orientations in the 16th, the 17th, 18th century. It's a huge you know, mm-hmm. consumerism mm-hmm. and a material structure is a huge part of modernity. So it makes sense to sort of say, well, what seems to be the most important thing? Well, it's, it's objects, right? We have this, this incredibly Stuff, yeah. powerful relationship with objects. So yeah. it makes sense to sort of focus in on objects. And one of the places you can find objects is in the ground. It's not the only one. The decorative arts do this as well. A lot of other people, a lot of other fields. Mm-hmm. But um, taking that material uh, standpoint saying, well, that the material is a crucial piece of, of human interaction within these societies. So that's a good place to start. And for me, that ends up being about Washington, right? So some, so those ideas sort of come to bear in, in the Washington sphere and, and how, how to monuments and memorials and objects and places and sites and buildings and so on all function. Right. And just to give our audience maybe a few examples of um, useful in archaeology, and this is just based on my time at Mount Vernon. Um, I know they talk a lot about food, so you're looking for mm-hmm. bones, you're looking for, um, you know, things that they might have worn. So clothing, food. I do remember for Fairy Farm, they found more wig curlers than yeah, they the wig curlers. they would, mm-hmm. which was kind of one of those huh. things that, like, not, I don't even know if I've ever seen a wig curler, but the oh, fact really? that they found more was something tiny really important. Tiny little barbells. Tiny, yeah. tiny little barbells. You just curl your, yeah. And that they, that because there was a lot more found than expected, that came to, I don't know what the conclusion was that they, they wore 
more wigs or it was just uh, I don't remember you know, what it meant, but it was very important. <laughs> they were curlier. They were more, <laughs> more curls. Um, just these little yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they can be hugely revealing. And the ex exclamations yeah. there have turned up an inordinately large number of them. Um, the numbers, <laughs> as I remember them, are comparable to the numbers that were found at the Charlton site in uh, I think it's the Charlton site. No, is that it? Well, yeah, I shouldn't say because I'm I'm not sure I'm going to get it right. But uh, the, the wig maker site, Colonial Williamsburg, like it's the, the the scale is comparable. Wow, um, <laughs> suggesting there's an enterprise going on, right? That's sort of right. That's what's okay, here. right. It, it it's a standout in a way because Washington himself didn't wear wigs. We know that he bought a wig for his younger brother, um, right. but something's going on there, and it would seem to be some sort of domestic enterprise that they're being maintained. Um, so. Hmm. I always wondered if they could be repurposed and sort of looked at a lot of different ways they could be repurposed, but that doesn't seem to be it. There, there's, there's, hmm. you know, somebody is doing some maintenance and then discarding them. So they're also being discarded. So they're, they're right. used and then not used anymore, but something's like kind of lock, stock and barrel. The, the way it works is you have to like roll the hair in the curlers mm -hmm. um, and then it gets baked, which is why they're made of ceramic because the, 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 the hair will heat up and tighten around the curlers. And, and that's how you right. get them. And then they're all different that's sizes. Really so it's over, yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> Except in yeah. this case, you put your whole head right in the. Which is <laughs> not a great idea. Think of those that's, burns. That's God. the wig, right? So, um, so yeah, and and all this fits into a larger interpretation of uh, the maintenance of gentility, right? That you have right the, the larger story in this, um, because at the same time that this is happening, uh, they're eating at that household a higher percentage of wild game mm -hmm. than you would see at a typical gentry home. We don't have a huge comparative yeah. base, but from what we do have, uh, it's a, a considerably higher percentage. So how do you explain all of this, the maintenance of, gen of gentry style? Well, we know, you know one of the questions that's always stood out in the Washington biography is why Mary Washington didn't remarry after Augustan Washington died. Um, and mm -hmm. that has been treated in a variety of different ways, and she gets written about quite a bit these days. Um, but people have sort of, you know, tug award about what the meaning of that is. But sidestepping that, what we do see is when Mary is running that household in the 1740s, she's doing what she can to maintain gentry stylings for her children so that they can get the right marriages. And she's very successful with that. Betty Washington marries across the river to Fielding Lewis, who's a distant mm -hmm. kinsman, but moves into a, a home that's that's far nicer and, and and then ultimately much nicer in 1773 when they built the new one. But, um, you know, gets gets a, a good gentry marriage. Um, and so we see evidence in the ground of, of her sort of working to maintain that, that gentry life without having the resources to just be able to buy and buy. Once you get Washington starting to do land work, starting to survey and speculate, that problem goes away because he starts – suddenly he's got money and, and things settle out. But there's right. a period of time in the 1740s um, when he's facing he's, – he's in sort of – it's hard to define it um, because the economy is so different. But they, they don't have resources, and he's conscious of it. He wrote about it in a couple different places in, in, in mm -hmm. his various writings that this was a hard time. Um, so everything sort of is happening then. They seem to be catch, catching more game, um, mm -hmm. eating more wild animals, which is a way to sort of offset costs and and stretching resources. And the wigs sort of, you know, they're, they're a little later than that, but they sort of fit into that uh, domestic economy, a successful domestic economy that Mary Washington was sort of responsible for. Right, that you most likely wouldn't see in documents. I mean, what they're right, eating, they right. probably wouldn't say that, so... Yeah, you have to be very lucky to get that stuff. Um, and, you, you know, you, you get a few things like recipe books, but a recipe book can only tell you what, you know, they wanted to do or what somebody said they should do. Right. It doesn't tell you a lot about what they actually did. So when you right. can get food remains, exactly. and, and food remains are tricky because there's no, you know, the, the ground wants to destroy, you know, <laughs> the organic material. So right. a, a lot of different things have to collide in order to be able to get the food remains in the first place. You need to have the right kind mm -hmm. of pH in the soil. Mm -hmm. Um and you're going to still lose a lot of small bones anyway, so you're going to end up with larger ones. You know, uh, they're going to survive a little better. Sometimes there'll be fires, and so there'll be things in the fire um, that have met the, the burning mm -hmm. kind of allowed them to survive. And there are techniques you can use uh, in the field to retrieve that and then do analysis of that. So you can get fish scales, you can get seeds, you can get a, a, a sense of the things that are coming out of the ground that way. So we were lucky that we were able to get so much as we were, as we were able to. But all of that, um, everybody's sort of always interested in what can we put together of diet. 
because that's an area, as you yeah. say, where there's just not a lot of documentation, but there is refuse in the ground. So right. that goes back to this question of, of what archaeology does. This is these are things that can address very effectively that um, that other sources really can't. So you know everything we find is garbage, right? It's all been deposited. <laughs> so right. it's, that's Exciting where you garbage. start, right? It's, you know, the, the, it's the opposite of a document. If a document is a sort of an effort to retain something by putting mm -hmm. it on paper, but you mm -hmm. know, it, it matters enough that it goes, you know, from a hand to a quill to ink to paper, and then is saved in some way. And then not only saved for those people, but saved through time mm -hmm. to the point where we can get at it, which is a rarity in and of itself, right? There's a whole process there by which we lose enormous amounts of paper. Um, but uh, that's all an act of retention. And what we see right. in the ground is the opposite. It's all, it's all, you know, discards, things that are broken and discarded. Yeah, I imagine that's illuminating for someone like Washington, who is so conscious of what he put in to writing. You know, like, it's almost you got to look at those around the time around the idea that he knew that this was going to be read at some point. Um, so uh, that, that seeing the unconscious uh, evidence uh, or the evidence of the unconscious actions is actually must Maybe be the must less be, curated. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah it's less <laughs> we, curated there's a the thing we haven't said yet that we have to bring into focus, of course, which is when you look at a place like Mount Vernon um, or Fairy Farm to, to, for that matter. Also, it's not like George is like living in a hut, you know, <laughs> and right. they just throw right. his garbage out there. There are communities there that are both enslaved and that are enslaving. And so, you have a variety of hands, a variety of people, a variety of intentions that all come to bear on creating that material record. So, you know, so what are we seeing? Who, whose actions are we seeing? Which, which raises really interesting right. questions about what constitutes ownership. Um, you know, the, you could argue that the enslaved, uh, since they are legally property, they can't steal, right? Because property can't steal property because... There isn't any change of ownership. The, right. own, the owner, fugitive owner, still owns both. <laughs> it, it may have been moved yeah, from right. one place to another, but it's not I'm stolen. I'm not sure George saw it that way, though. <laughs> but there, but <laughs> this is a tension in that institution, right? That yeah. is, right. It's a tension within right. enslavement. So, you know, if somebody is responsible for a set of silver, say, for example, a silver tea set, and their world's sort of focused on that, there's a sort of form of ownership that, that attaches to that. Um, so, sure. That's, that exists within the context of enslavement. So when we see these things on the ground, like what are we seeing? And so when we start to talk about people who are marginalized in the documentary record, mm -hmm. uh, silenced in the documentary record, well, suddenly the architectural, sorry, the uh, archaeological record becomes hugely interesting because we can see yeah. their actions. We can see the actions of people whose, whose names we do not know. Um, but when we find deposits in slave quarters or so on, you know, then we are looking at things that were put there one way or another by people who were enslaved. And so now we can right. ask all kinds of questions about how they are behaving and what do we see of them. So one of the things that to give you a fairy farm example, that's sort of interesting. Um, there's a very large stone cellar in the center of the building and you can see it. You can go to the, to the museum you can see inside the stairway, you can look down into it. Sort of was the, uh, the, the main feature, the lovely thing made of, of nicely cut Aquia sandstone. It had only one entry point, and that was to the outside. So there was an over-under door entrance. The main door of the house faced the river. There was sort of stairways up to it, as far as we were able to tell. And then there was an entryway right below it. So you could go up the stairs and go into the house, or you could go inside and go into the cellar. Um, so what's happening in that cellar? There's a lot of questions about that. Um, it's an interesting one. As far as we're able to tell, it doesn't appear to have a direct entry into the home. So mm -hmm. it may be that the only way in or out is through that door. So that mm -hmm. space is completely separate from the rest of the house. And this is something that we see a lot in, in buildings and are always sort of interested in. How can you move through these spaces? How do you, mm -hmm. um, what doors are barred to you? What doors are open to you? It becomes very interesting. So this space appears to be sort of contained. Um, it's not well positioned for the storage of really large objects. So, you know, huge casks coming in and out of it is not going to work very well. So it has to be only small stuff. You can't wheel a huge cask inside of it. So it's domestic, presumably. But if you want to get something from it, you have to go outside, down, get it, and come back up. So the Washington family probably are not doing that. That would be the work of enslaved people who would be sort mm -hmm. of, you know, mm -hmm. pulling things out and moving them around. But it's also domestic. It doesn't 
the kitchen, for example, is on the other side of the building. So there has to be another storage area where, where food stuff is being stored because you don't, you know, right. so what is being stored in that cellar, right? What, what is going right. on in that space? That's an interesting space. It wasn't built by the Washingtons. It was built by William Struther and was there when Augustine purchased the building. But what is happening in that space? So it's very hard to tell this. It's, we could be wrong about access, but I don't think we are for a few different reasons that aren't worth going into. But, um, but one of the things that we saw in the corners, two of the corners of the building, were complete oyster shells set in holes. So like hmm. complete closed oyster shells set deliberately in holes. Well, hmm. this, is, this is a West African practice where you are sort of marking the area, sort of like creating a, a passage zone, but hollow vessels, right, that can sort of contain and, and sort of enclose. So, you know, we, we may be looking at it could be that people are actually living in there, that that's more of a domestic space than, hmm. than we initially thought. But it means right. something to someone enslaved in that space who felt the need to sort of enact some kind of spiritual uh, cosmological meaning hmm. in that space. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's no different than somebody putting, you know, than somebody Jewish putting a mezuzah on the door. It's like you do these things because sure. this is what your home, this, this makes something domestic. So right. we see something like that happening in that cellar space. Hmm. So, you know, it's a very small thing, two little small things, but suddenly we're able to enter into uh, an important piece of the, the, uh, the social dynamics of, of that home and who's moving in and out and how. Um, so right. the documents are not going to give you anything about that. The only thing Absolutely we can get not. in the documents is, is or we get names of people, but it's very hard to attach them to anything in the ground. Um, right. We do have a case in 1750, 1751, where uh, there is a, a man named Tame, T-A-M-E, African man, with the only man, or woman for that matter, with an African-sounding name in the entire list of Washington's mm -hmm. enslaved people at Ferry mm -hmm. Farm. And he's murdered uh, by a guy named Harry. Uh, and the end result, of course, is that Harry is executed by the state, and Mary Washington's able to appeal and get the money for that execution because the state will pay you back the value of the person the state executed, right. not for the one who was killed. Now, this didn't happen at Ferry Farm, but these are the people who move back and forth from Ferry Farm. It seems to happen mm -hmm. on one, of the, or it seems to happen on an outlying part of the plantation. It doesn't happen in the home, but there's 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 trauma happening. There's some kind of social disruption happening in that world in that period. So when we see these oyster shells, there's like, well, what are, what are we seeing, right? We're, we're, we're seeing very faint clues about how uh, a deeply undocumented group of people are trying to order their universe and make sense of their world in adverse conditions. Right. Gosh, that's fascinating. Yeah. I think that that's how it, you know, it's, it, you, you said like, you know, the past doesn't exist, but this does give you almost as like a, a small glimpse, like a faint glimmer of like, of mm -hmm. like what, it, what, how it did exist, which is a, you know, a fascinating. And that, that's part of the visualize. magic of spaces, right? I mean, everybody's been to battlefields and sort of, you know, had that like, oh right. my God, this is like, you know, all of that happened here. That That's kind of astounding, right? So right. Um, spaces are really powerful that way, which, which goes back to memory, right? That these things mean something. It's like just, there's some... Yeah connection and and archaeology is a wonderful way to kind of get at that and, and use those spaces so yeah we're all extremely privileged to you know to, to be able to be in those spaces no question i no one i've never met anybody doing archaeology who doesn't sort of you know it may become jaded over time but everybody knows that you know that this is really special this is really really special yeah. and and since it is an inherently destructive process um when we take something apart we are the only people who will ever have done that um, that's true well, you know it's like it's us and so we are interacting with it. when you pull something out of the ground that's not been touched for a few hundred years there is unquestionably something kind of interesting and special that happens there and i think as i say people may be jaded about it but ultimately that's that physical connection to the material is at the root of of the uh of the connection is at the root of the inspiration to do this and we are you know material creatures living in you know the society is very much organized around material possessions. So, you know, Absolutely. it's not a surprise that we feel that way about objects, right? That objects convey special meanings to us. Yeah, I think that's an incredibly poignant uh, uh, place for us to end. We're coming, actually coming up to, the, to, to our hour here. Sure. Um, but uh, yeah, no, that's a, that's a, that's a remarkable uh, uh, sentiment. Uh, you know, and, Everyone uh, should read Phil's moving. book. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you want to go and check out Phil's book, yeah. please go check out 
permanent resident uh or I mean, any other number of his books he has, recently has a book out about chickens uh the, yes the, the, um which is re- really we'll talk about that another time um, that's a whole other story yes <laughs> yeah that's season two yeah. okay so <laughs> Yeah. Chicken book is coming. Um, out. Is there anywhere else um, that um, people can and can find your work or any um, uh, uh, on online social media or any, any place um, if yeah, anyone's interested? Super in your, active your on social books? media. I'm, I'm not super active. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's mostly mostly in published writing, but the books are out there. Um, right. Go to the sites. You know, if there's one thing to say, it's you know, go to these places. You know, go sign guest books. Tell the rangers you're yes. there to see things. You know, go go support museums. This is you know, can't say this enough. There's there's this feeling that these things just exist and that they'll exist in perpetuity. Right. And everyone has to understand. Anyone who cares about these things has to understand that every single thing is in jeopardy. There's there's no such thing as permanent protection. It just doesn't exist. Even right the grandest of the national parks, it only takes an act of Congress or, or a presidential order. Just wipe it out, wipe it out of existence, turn it into private hands and it's over. So, you know, every single thing is precious and rare. Every single preserved thing is precious and rare. And if it's a building, they're also being subjected to the normal conditions that wither away structures. So they're, they're kind of melting in front of us. So, you know, go to these sites, talk with people there and, Make sure that you that, that if you care about these things, that you're making these sites part of how you can live your life. Be at them, engage with them, take them seriously, and and bring people to them because they're they're not making any more of them. <laughs> nobody's nobody's making right. any more 17th century, 18th century homes, right? This is all we have, yeah. and and we're if as resource. they go away, we, we lose them. So you know we're we're often not focused on that. We're focused much more on development and growth. But it's so important. That we that we treasure these places and really give them the vote of support that going to them means. That yeah, was I've said, said it before. I'll say it again. You're within an hour's drive of something cool historically. Almost go. always. Yep. I don't care where you yep. live. Almost always. I don't care where you live in the country. You're within an hour's drive. Go. You heard what Phil said. Go right now. What are you waiting for? Get in the car. <laughs> don't care if you're work. On your get way. up. Go. Yeah. <laughs> get up and leave. Tell them we told Walk you. Walk out. I hope you're <laughs> Tell them we told you. <laughs> Tell them Phil said so. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much for uh, All right. Thank you. This was us. really wonderful, guys. Thanks for this. Thanks so much for being Appreciate here it. with us. All right. Talk to you again. Thank you for listening to the full episode of Too Complicated for History. We hope you enjoyed the episode. And if you did, please leave us a review on Odyssey, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Be sure to follow us on our social platforms at 2C4H underscore podcast, or check out the link in the description. This will keep you in the loop for show updates, new episodes, and exclusive content. Too Complicated for History is a podcast from Primary Source Media, produced by Patrick Long and Lynn Price Robbins. Edited and mixed by Curtis Fritch. Opening theme music by Sheena Biratella.